I think this is the time. <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I think it's time for the second invited speaker's talks. So, my name is Iftihar Heather. I am a PhD student in the Department of Linguistics here at UIUC. UIUC. So I'm really pleased and excited to introduce our second invited speaker, Dr. Paul Ovinki. Dr. Paul Ovinki is a professor in the Department of Linguistics at Michigan State University. And uh, she has a PhD from Georgetown University in 2005. Uh, she is a core faculty member in the Second Language Studies PhD program, and uh, she she's also contractor of Masters of Arts in Foreign Language Teaching, and uh, she also teaches the uh, courses in Masters of Arts in TESOL. She's a current president of Midwestern Association of Language Testers, and uh, I have to say she's one of the vibrant force in this particular organization. A uh, couple of years ago, she was here. She gave the full day workshop here related to the placement testing and then last year also she offered a very interactive workshop at uh, MWALT uh, conference at Michigan State University. She has a variety of research interests and uh, her major area of research are second language and foreign language deals with the research related to reliability and validity. The one interesting thing about her studies is like with the validity she deals at the broader level, like including some of the social dimensions of the validity as well, and she used mixed methods, qualitative and quantitative methods. So in recognition of our research in the 2012, uh, Paula was awarded the uh, uh, Distinguished Researcher for her study on the No Child Left Behind, and that's really prestigious award. And then in the 2009, she was awarded the Best Article Award from the CALCO, that is Computer Assisted Language Instruction Consortium. And we are really lucky to have her here, and we really appreciate that she is the frequent visitor of UIUC campus. And uh, please join me in wel welcoming Dr. Paula Winky, and today she'll be presenting uh, what can eye movement records tell us about language learners' cognitive processing? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really happy to be here. And it's finally a beautiful spring day, so I'm happy you decided to stay as well and, and see this through. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today are eye movement records and what they can tell us about language learners' cognitive processing. Now, eye movement records are often used in L1 studies. So theoretical linguists will rejoice as well because um, that is the foundation for the studies in second language acquisition. Um, so I think the L1 literature is much richer and deeper and a lot more has been done with eye tracking in native language research, which is what we call it, the L1 research. Um, and we're learning a lot from that body of research. Um, in second language studies. So what I'm going to do today, I'm going to go through a little introduction about what we know about L1 reading processes due to L1 eye tracking research. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about eye trackers and what they look like in case you're unfamiliar with them. Um, they're really neat machines. <laughs> so, and then we'll talk, uh, I'm going to talk about two different empirical studies. One on second language learners processing of novel grammar while reading and the second one is um, second language learners processing of video and captions during video-based listening exercises. So these both relate very much to foreign language materials that are used by teachers in the classroom. The first one is more textbook-based, but also is used in online environments. The second one is a result of captioning um, subtitles being so frequently used now with videos in, in foreign language classrooms. But I'm going to conclude with what eye trackers don't tell us. And in particular, with foreign language uh, studies or second language studies, there's a lot that's left unexplained. So this is where um, some of Melissa Boole's uh, research on stimulated recall and think aloud protocols can help inform and triangulate um, eye tracking data. Right. So I first wanted to talk about, since this is a technology and uh, this is a pretty expensive piece of the technology, how I got my hands on an eye tracker. And basically my mentor, Susan Gass at MSU, when she was interviewing me for the job back in 2004, she said, what do you want to do here at MSU beyond your dissertation? Um, and I said, oh, 
I want to get an eye tracker and see what language learners do with captions while watching videos. And she said, great, let's do that. And it's kind of like your dad asking you, so what do you want to do when you turn 16? And you say, I want to drive in the Grand Prix. <laughs> and then he says, great, here's some keys. Let's do that. Um, because there's so much that we had to learn that we didn't even know about. So it's kind of stepping your toe into the ocean. And then once you get fully submerged, you realize you don't know how to swim. Um, so I am not a psycholinguist. Um, nor am I someone who has a background in eye tracking research. So, um, so this is maybe not the best way to do it. So what we did is we applied for grants to get an eye tracker. At the time in 2005, most eye trackers were around $65,000. So it is like a very nice car. Um, and we were denied left and right um, from at least three major grant proposals. That, um, so what we decided to do is just take a step backwards, and we borrowed time on an eye tracker in psychology. So if you think, oh, I'll never do an eye tracking study because I don't have access to one, look around at your university. There are probably several. Um, and if they're underutilized, you might be able to borrow time on them. Or if you have grant funding, to pay $15, $25 an hour to get access to them. Money talks. Um, we were able to borrow time on an eye tracker because Eric Altman, a psychologist, um, had some free time, and he had an RA who was willing to help us out. So our first study um, was with captions, and I'm going to show you that data, and it was collected on borrowed time from an eye tracker. Then we hired our own graduate research assistant, Tetiana Sodorenko, to help us with the technical details, and she became an expert by working with us on this. We also then finally obtained MSU internal funding for our first eye tracker. But then we realized we were really in over our necks. We needed to hire a psycholinguist. So we hired an expert in eye tracking in SLA. Uh, Dr. Aline Godfroyd is now a core faculty in our program. And she really is the expert in eye tracking. And we draw a lot of our knowledge from her. We got a second eye tracker through the same funding stream. We had to hire two more graduate research assistants. We gathered experts on eye tracking um, and SLA, second language acquisition, at the Second Language Research Forum in 2010 for a colloquium. And we turned that colloquium into a um, studies in second language acquisition special issue that just came out last spring. So it's slowly built, because this is a nine-year research agenda from telling Sue I wanted keys to a really nice car and then finally being able to do something with it. Right. Um, so there are a lot of practical tips and readings that you can do to, if you want to get into this further. A lot of universities have special courses on eye tracking. Um, so I present some of these um, articles and also some very good books that are out there because we've had to go back and, and look into those. These are things that psycholinguists probably have already read about in their coursework. Um, and I think SLA is so interdisciplinary. We're always borrowing tools from other fields. Um, so this isn't uncommon, but also you have to Proceed with a little bit of caution. Right. So eye movement data provide quantitative evidence of a person's visual attentional processes when performing a task such as reading. So there's been a lot of comprehensive overviews of eye movements during reading. But here are what they tell us at the most ba basic level. So these are somewhat like universals for reading, um, especially for native speakers of English, adults who have no cognitive or reading difficulties. So readers se sequentially fix their eyes on individual words, right? So your eye moves from word to word. And this sounds very basic. You're going to agree with everything because it's, yes, this is what we do. Um, so you'll see here the lines showing um, the saccadic movement, the eyeballs jumping from one word to the other in, the, in terms of a saccade. So you can count the number, number of humps, and that's the number of saccades. But then there's also periods of fixation, where your eye actually fixates on the word. Your eye actually never stops moving. It's a muscle, right? But it's, it stops moving enough that a machine can register it as a fixation, right? So we have fixations and saccades. But you'll notice this is the eye moving forward through text. It often does jump backwards, either because there's been a cognitive processing difficulty, and you're like, oh, what did I read? Oh, yeah, OK. And then going backwards or forwards in text. But also because the eye is a muscle, 
Maybe it just needs a rest. Like if you imagine when you're typing, you'll pause every now and then because it's a cognitive process too, and your hands get tired. You can imagine your eyeballs do too. <laughs> so, um, so there's some movements that are tied directly to mental processes and others which are ascribed by different theorists to just oclomotor movement um, is part of the manual processing of, of eye movements. Right? So there are some basic models. Okay, so psychotic movements from one word to another happen as readers recognize and process the words normally, but not always. Right? But the general gist of one of the larger models of the of what people do when they read is called the easy reader model, and it posits that skilled readers first check their familiarity with the word and then access the meaning of the word, and then they move on to the next word. So do you buy that? Does it sound good? Yeah? Okay. Then you can say, I, I ascribe to the easy reader model. You'll notice in eye tracking research, people will front and tell you which model they believe in, right? <laughs> um, so a competing view, I don't find them competing. I think they're both kind of plausible, but I haven't seen anyone argue, I like both. <laughs> or I like this for that. But a competing view is a swift model, and it's that psychotic movement is largely automatic. The eye may jump to the next word before the brain has recognized and processed the previous one. So you might like that one better. I don't know. But I, I ascribe mostly to the easy reader model because studies have shown that eye movement patterns depend on the characteristics of language and the difficulty level of the text. But regardless of whether you use easy reader or the swift, researchers have made some basic observations concerning eye movement during reading. They're like the benchmark data. They differ slightly for alphabetic and character-based languages. Um, but this is the average, this is the plan. This is what the average reader does. Commonalities regarding eye movements. In young adult, um, skilled, native language reading, you can imagine these are probably 18 to 30 year olds, what they generally do. And so if the writing system is alphabetic, like English or German, versus character-based, like Chinese, um, there's an average fixation duration of about a quarter of a second, right? 200 to 250 milliseconds is how long you pause and look at a word. Um, it's a bit longer in character based because of information density, right? A character, two characters can be a whole word where English somewhat spreads it out a little more. So there's a longer pause generally with denser languages. Hebrew is the same, right? Um, some, and the average saccata length for alphabetic is seven to nine letter spaces, but in characters it's two to three characters, right? And processing depends on word length in both, um, word predictability and word frequency, and the amount of skipping. You don't look at every single word directly. You might see it, though, in the paraphobia, right? You might see it and be able to process it, but not look exactly at it. Um, so the amount of skipping, 25 to 30 percent of all words in a given text can be skipped with English. It's about the same in um, Chinese. And ten, uh, the amount of regressions, like how often do you normally go backwards and reread things in, in your language. So it's a bit more in Chinese, and that could be due to the density of the characters. Um, and about 10 percent of the time for skilled readers in English. Okay. So far, so good. So you got these almost universals for reading, and these are the models that show normal reading patterns, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there are the application of this is so interesting. So bilingual readers, let's say of Hebrew and English, use wider perceptual spans. So there's cross linguistic differences, not just um, with Chinese and English, but you can imagine with all the diverse and different languages out there. So Bilingual readers of Hebrew and English use a wider perceptual span when reading English because English is semantically less dense than Hebrew. So the perceptual span is the area of sight in which the words may be processed and comprises one's direct fixation area, called the fovea, and the area of partial sight called the paraphobia that extends about five degrees on either side of the fovea. And there have been studies to show that people who read normally in English, your paraphobia is an oval, and it's larger in the direction that you read, right? 
And so if you read in Arabic, you actually physically are able to process and see more on the other side. It's almost like being left-handed or right-handed in terms of reading. And people who are bilingual in reading can do both. They can toggle back and forth with relative ease. But people who are learning, let's say, Arabic, there is a struggle to see and process what's on the other side, the incoming text stream. Right? So, um, so some of this is explaining some of the cognitive difficulties in learning languages due to script differences. It's not just the script, but it's a physical difference in training your eyes to move and recognize information coming in in the wrong direction. It's like crossing the street in London. It's difficult, right? <laughs> okay. So models of eye movement during reading show that skilled young adult readers reading in their native language rarely stray from these benchmarks established by like readers in their native language. But because of this, eye tracking research is used to investigate, well, we've got our advertiser person. Has she gone? <laughs> ah, great. Mm -hmm. Font choices and their impact on reading, website text display, usability studies, children's developmental reading pro um, patterns, what's normal for a four-year-old versus five versus six. Um, there's a long history of that research being done. Um, benchmarks of reading at different ages and normal versus not normally reading children. The effects of dyslexia on reading. Eye movement control treatments, um, different patterns of pattern practice for children with dyslexia to see if that improves their reading ability. And cross-language and native versus non-native reading patterns. So it's really a neat area of study. Um, to get into. So I was talking about the website usability. Now that you know some basics of eye tracking, can you tell me why that one's bad and why this one's good? What does that one do that you can now attribute to what readers like to do just physically with their eyes when they're reading? Anyone volunteer? What's wrong with the bad one? You have to skip an entire picture to get Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. The saccade doesn't know where to land, right? Because you've got to, it breaks up the reading process, pure and simple, right? So whenever you stray from the benchmarks, you're going to have cognitive breakdown, right? It's like you're driving the car on the highway and there's a pothole. Well, all of a sudden you lose control a little bit. And that's distracting, right? So a lot of the website usability studies are things like this, um, which makes sense intuitively too if you think about it, right? Um, but a lot of this has to do with the patterns in reading that humans like, right? Mm -hmm. We don't like to see potholes. <laughs> okay, I saw a lot of them this morning when I was driving here. <laughs> Some of the roads are really bad. Okay, so models of eye movement while reading such as the easy reading model can account for processing difficulties during reading. You can see it in the eye movement record that there's been some processing difficulty, even if it's not so clear, like the pothole that you saw there with the graphic in the middle, but it can be marked mathematically through the eye movement record. So visual patterns that go against the benchmarks in the model signal reading problems, right? But the models have very, they have a lot of trouble disentangling processing difficulties from necessary and fruitful higher level processing. That is, time a reader may take to think about what was just read. And this is where, as a second language acquisition researcher, this is very exciting for me. Because for adults reading in their native language, if there's a processing problem, we usually attribute it to the text. But with a second language learner, the processing problem may be because they're unfamiliar with what they're reading. There's a novel vocabulary word or a new grammar construction that they don't understand. But the eye movement record doesn't tell you if they solve the problem, right? It is solvable, usually. Um, so this is where it's more complicated with second language learners. Yeah. So what interest applies, applied linguists is how eye movements change when the reading process breaks down when readers do not recognize words, do not understand passages, or struggle with ambiguities, garden path sentences, or inconsistencies in the text. All right, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background on what the eye trackers look like. Um, this is one of our eye trackers at Michigan State. This is an iLink 1000 um, from SR Research, which is in Canada. Um, and if you purchase an eye tracker from them, they will include a three-day training package. So 
Um, when we bought it initially, they sent someone down to help us install it, and then they gave us a three-day training workshop and how to use it. So it got us a kickstart um, to get it working. Um, but what you'll see is the participant is going to sit here, and the researcher sits over here, kind of drives from behind. Um, there are different mounts with this type of eye tracker. This eye tracker is great for sentence processing, even looking at what people are looking at at the word level. And if you make the font big enough, it can tell you what part of the word, if you're looking at gender agreement or something like that. Um, so they're very accurate. You can use a tower mount, a desktop mount with a head stabilizer, um, or you can put a remote sticker to track um, eye movements. There's an infrared camera. Here, I just, uh, this is one of our graduate students, and the infrared camera reads the back of the eyeball through the uh, pupil and then uses measurements to detect where that person is looking on screen. Okay? So it's important to have the camera and screen at the proper location and at the correct distance from the eye. So there's a lot of setup for these studies. Eye tracking data is expensive to collect in terms of time. If calibration is poor or distance between the eye and camera, or if the screen is incorrect, you can have miscalibration and then the results aren't what you, they're not reliable. You also often lose participants due to poor calibration. Not everyone's eyes can be tracked. Um, their eye was or could not be tracked properly. Um, so this is an image of a calibration when students put their head in the chin rest a series of dots appear on the screen to calibrate their eye to the, the computer is saying look at this dot and you look at that dot and then the computer can see how far off it thinks you are so it can give estimates and you'll notice that the eye movement record is always better in the middle of the screen and the further away you get from the middle of the screen the worse the eye tracker is because of the angles right mm -hmm. So those ones on the sides are not so good. So you can think about this when you're designing material. Where would you want your areas of interest to be? Probably right smack dab in the middle would be the best, but that's not ecologically valid in all, all the time. Okay. Oh, well, there's another one too. This one is this is a person who could not be tracked because their eye, the eye, the camera just couldn't get a good grip on where that person was looking. Um, we found that contact lenses and eyeglasses are problematic because the camera is looking for the pupil. It's looking for the darkest spot. But here, this is one of our students, Se Hoon, had his glasses on, and the black of the glasses attracts the camera. So we get a lot of messy data because it keeps jumping, thinking that different parts of his glasses are um, the pupil. So what we do is we have masking tape. We tape up people's glasses. Looks very silly. They don't like that. Um, here there's a reflection on his glasses, and that also confuses the camera. We have a lot of different things that we try to do. We have makeup remover to get rid of that black mascara that the camera might think is a pupil. Um, sometimes the students want to use it, sometimes they don't. We ask them not to wear mascara before they come in, but of course the undergrads have tons. <laughs> so, um, so good pupil detection looks like this. But you can see here where sometimes people just have beautiful lush eyelashes or nice eyebrows. The camera keeps thinking that's the pupil. So then um, you can't track their eyes. So we have found that um, certain hair colors and different eyebrow colors in types are, we have less success in tracking the eyes. Um, so when I was collecting data from native speakers of Korean, I had a very high attrition in my study. Um, but it's, it's part of it, it's just physics, right? <laughs> uh, so this is a picture of the different, uh, different eye tracker. This is the Toby eye tracker from Sweden. And this one's different from the other in that it's completely heads, head movement free, right? So this one is not as accurate as the other, but children are not scared by it. Um, instead of having dots appear on the screen, we can change it to rubber ducks or baby rattles um, so that you can track with some accuracy the movements of children as they look at things on the screen um, as well. Or if you want people to be doing things, 
Um, the other one, when your head is stabilized, you can't really fill out a form at the same time. But with this one, you can. So I'll talk about this one more on Monday when I talk about a rater. Um, this is a rater looking at a rubric and using different sections of the rubric to grade an essay that she has in front of her. So it's nice when you have big areas of interest, and not words. I don't care about words with this study, but in the ones I'm going to talk about today, I do. Okay. So back to the Toby eye tracker. Yeah, this is another view of the Toby eye tracker. Um, the researcher also has the laptop to control it from the side. Yeah. So here the cameras are actually embedded just below the monitor. Um, we have our student Yens sitting there. Okay. Um, the Toby research, or the Toby eye tracker also gives a little bit different data. And this is the one that's used more in advertising or website usability. CMC research by Brian Smith at Arizona. Um, he uses heat maps to see where people are looking at on websites. Um, so you can get an area, you know, is this part of the gloss? Are students looking at glossed text in my online language learning program? Things like that. Um, so I'm going to talk about the first empirical study. It's uh, about second language learners processing a novel grammar while reading. So here's a text, or part of a text, and you'll notice there's a grammar form underlined, right? And one of its, it's two types of this grammar form, past tense and present. Do you know what grammar form this is? Passive constructions, yes. Mm -hmm. So usually you don't learn that until, I don't know, maybe you get introduced to it during your second semester of a language program. You might get a better handle on it in your third or fourth semester of learning English. So oftentimes what textbooks do, um, or what teachers do in, when they first introduce a content passage, um, is they just have them read it, you know, Here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to read this passage. Your textbook might have this in it. But students won't know why certain forms are highlighted. And later in the lesson, the teacher will say, oh, t we're also you know, going to learn passive forms. The so passive is used a lot in this text. So then that becomes a target of instruction um, as students move through. So this is what I was interested in. Korean native speakers, when they don't yet passive form, how much learning, I guess, or development comes about by just simply and very explicitly or implicitly highlighting the form. Um, so these are the areas of interest that I'm, I'm interested in. Okay. So this is an area of SLA research. It's called text in input enhancement, textual enhancement. And it's been researched a lot. And it's an implicit input technique, which sounds very jargony because it is very jargony, <laughs> which aims at drawing learners' attention to linguistic features. It's done through modification of the physical appearance of text. Right? Um, its importance of enhancing as target linguistic features are more likely to be a t paid attention to and become part of intake. So this is part of our input and interaction theory. So going against crashing, that you just need access to the input and you'll absorb the language. You don't need instruction. Well, language teachers, we all think you need instruction, especially if you're an adult. And this is a low-level form of instruction. Your teachers will manipulate the text just enough so that she, later in the lesson here she can point this out. And you've already been, been a little bit sensitized to it, maybe, by reading it in the first place with the enhancement there. So it's studying this very fine nuance of language learning. What, it, what really happens in terms of attention? Does this really draw your attention in a beneficial way? Okay. So there's been a lot of studies on this, positive, um, that it helps with recall, noticing production. It helps students even with learning. And this teachers are very glad for, because if they are going to take the time to mark up the forms in the text, then Hopefully, it should have some positive effect. But some people, two researchers have found that it actually detracts from comprehending the text, of what's there. Um, and some say, oh, it doesn't make any effect. There's no effect at all. Um, so the research is split, but no one had yet done it with an eye tracker. So I thought, oh, here's a nice opportunity to look at this research anew, and can we see actually quantitative difference in how much attention people pay to these? Okay. So in the, 
I think to save time, I'm going to skip through some of this. This is eye tracking studies in SLA. Um, what's been done before? There's a lot on gender agreement, ambiguity resolution by bilinguals, uh, syntactic ambiguity, recasts in um, computer mediated communication, and there's been a lot of reviews in SLA saying more eye tracking studies are needed. Um, yeah, so there have been other measures to look at input enhancement, this feature, and some of those are self-paced reading or people um, telling the researcher what they used. So I'm using eye tracking and I'm replicating a study that used the same grammatical form with Korean language learners in 2007. So what Lee was asking in 2007 is what's, what's the, the effect of the input enhancement? And he found that students who read an enhanced text performed significantly, significantly better on the, on the form. They learned the passive construction than if they didn't have enhancement. But he also found that when the text was enhanced, when the grammatical forms were highlighted, students paid less attention to what the text was about. So they did poor on a comprehension text test. So I had um, an enhanced, or he had an enhanced form with a, uh, with 132 people and unenhanced with 127. So after, so there were two separate groups, right? So the ones who got it enhanced learned the form, passives, and the people who didn't have an enhanced didn't learn the passives. But it was flopped for comprehension. So it was a great study, big splash in SSLA. Everyone was like, wow, this is so cool. So I thought, well, let's look at it again, because I'm not so sure about this. <laughs> OK. So he also asked, what's the relationship between performance and on the correction task and comprehension? He couldn't really answer that, because he also looked at text familiarity. It was a very complex study that he had. Um, so I'm going to skip to my replication. So what I did was for, um, for one group of students, they got the form enhanced. And for the other one, they didn't. So I'm using an eye tracker, try eye tracker to investigate how it affects the reading behavior or process. Do they pause and look at those enhanced forms longer than if they're not enhanced? So two separate groups again, just like in Lee. And I also added working memory tests to see if working memory is responsible for form comprehension trade-offs. Um, so I had 80 participants. Lee had almost 200 participants, but again, it's very expensive. He did his in intact classes. I had to come up, have them come in one at a time into the language lab. So out of the 80 Korean students, only 55 obtained scores of B1 or B2 on the uh, pretest of reading. I wanted them to all be at about the same level of reading proficiency. And um, the 55 demonstrated on a grammar pretest that they had not yet learned or mastered this passive construction. So that was kind of a baseline for being in the study. Okay, so they had background questionnaires. They took it, the reading test of English. I gave them two different working memory tests. I can tell you more about those later if you're interested. Two different texts. So one group saw it enhanced. The other group saw it unenhanced. They had 30 in one group and 25 in the unenhanced. And then I also gave directions because this was missing from a lot of the prior studies. In eye movement research, there's been studies that have said that if you give set of directions A versus set of directions B, the eye movement records are different. And that makes total sense, because if you tell people, read this and I'll give you a test afterwards, versus read this for fun or skim this, people read differently, right? So I asked Lee, did you give directions? And I didn't really get a response, so I gave directions because teachers give directions. I don't know any teacher who just says, read this. Maybe they do, but <laughs> they have to explain afterwards. Um, and then I gave a free recall test to measure comprehension um, and also a post-test and exit questionnaire. So this is what the data looks like from one person um, on one of the trials. So you'll see the circles is a fixation. And then there's a little number next to the fixation that's the number of milliseconds that they spent looking, that the eye a tracker recorded them as looking at that. Now the boxes around the words, the students did not see. They're, 
invisible to the, to the student, but that's the area that I'm most interested in. So I don't care about the other data so much. I want to know about the, the form, the grammatical form. So here's one of the, um, let's see if this is right. Oops, I think this is a video. Oops, maybe my next one is. I wanted it to play. Okay. Okay. For some reason, my video is not playing. Really? It is, but it's linked, and I've got the original, so maybe I'll jump over to the file and see if I can get it to play. Oops. Okay, so this is um, a recording of a person while they're reading. So you can see the green is where their eye is. You can see the saccades and the fixations. So the area of interest is was detained. And you notice they've regressed, went back to it, and then went on. So that's when it's unenhanced. And we see more of an effect, I hope, <laughs> when it's enhanced. Okay. So here you'll see the eye movement over was brought. Then I did an average for the entire groups. So I'm looking at group averages and not necessarily at individuals. Um, okay. So I'll just wait till it gets to was brought. Is there, so then they fixate that, they went back. So you can see it's still very fast. The differences are small, um, but they can be meaningful too. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, I see it. Oh, I'll go down here. Nope. From current slide. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how does enhancement affect the reading of the enhanced text? I found that the results from the eye tracking data found that when the passive constructions were enhanced, learners fixated on them more often and gazed at them longer, even though there were no significant differences between the groups and how much time overall was spent on the reading passage. So they spent the same amount of time reading the text, but some of the time did get drawn away, it seems, from reading the text over and focusing on those grammatical forms for this group of Korean um, native speakers. Okay. So what are the effects of textual enhancement on students' acquisition of form and comprehension of meaning? So results from a t-test showed no group differences in passive form, oops, passive form learning. Both groups made significant gains on the post-test of the form learning. And a second t-test displayed no group differences in reading comprehension. So what was the relationship between performance on the correction tasks and comprehension scores? So when I correlated these, for the enhanced group, there was no relationship between correction tasks and comprehension scores. I was replicating what um, Lee did when he did find an effect, but I did not across either group or for either group. Mm -hmm. And I looked at the working memory, too. Did I see any patterns there? I really didn't. For the enhanced group, those with lower working memory reading span scores received longer, significantly higher gain scores than those in the enhanced group. Uh, when passives were enhanced, lower working memory was found to be related to being able to learn the passive form better. When passives were not enhanced, working memory was not a factor in learning the form. But I found people in all cases. Um, so the trend are these that people with low recall and high form, they learned the enhanced as well as those with high recall and low form. But I found people in all cells. So it was hard to make predictions on how much working memory really has to do with it. Um, I couldn't find any clear evidence that working memory mediated how much attention you would pay to um, the forms. Yeah. So it, this pattern, these varying patterns corroborate research, corroborate research that suggests that the cognitive effects of input enhancement are rather learner dependent and not systematic across the board. Right? There's a lot of variation in the data even when I, I look at group averages and I see differences. But you look at the individuals and you see every type of person possible. Right? Mm -hmm. 
So when I look at fixation durations across the 17 passive forms, so 17 times the passive form was, was enhanced or not enhanced. And the passive form in this passage occurred 17 times. So I see that when it's enhanced, overall they look at it longer, right? But the patterns of how long they look throughout a text are similar, which is not surprising. You get bored right, <laughs> when you're reading, and you pay less attention to certain features as you continue to read. And you see that trend here throughout the, um, throughout the text. So I learned that enhancement did not result in measurable learning gains, but enhancement did result in longer fixations, which may indicate a greater level of attention, um, which could be the first step along the path in learning, or a better phrase here, learner development. So we don't see evidence of learning, but we see evidence of more attention. So eye tracking is not the holy grail that explains once and for all everything about input enhancement as I'd hoped it would. <laughs> I guess I have to do more studies. Um, but eye tracking is promising for investigating the behaviors that are exhibited in response to enhanced versus unenhanced text. And it goes through the different levels of attention and awareness, right? Because you can be aware of the passive form to the level that you know it, you can explain it, you can use it, and you're pretty accurate, but then low levels, you've seen it before, you recognize it, those low levels of awareness of the form, and I think here we see the beginning of noticing, the lowest level that students detected it or noticed it in while reading, but maybe subconsciously, or maybe they processed it very minimally, we don't know, and this is where the eye movement record is silent. We know that they were looking at it longer, there's generally an eye-mind link that what you look at is what you think about, but how much cognitive processing is really going on, you still can't get into their heads, unfortunately. Right? You still don't know. It's some evidence, but not conclusive. So I also did a second study. This is the one that Susan Gass and I wanted to do right away. We had to backtrack. We, I did the input enhancement study, she did another one. So I think for sake of time, I will go on just to show you the video of what we're looking at. Um, what I mean by captions is when the audio is in the same language as the text that appears on screen. So what we did is we captioned videos and we dubbed them, we dubbed them and captioned them in different languages. Um, and I'll skip to the good stuff. <laughs> so what do learners, on what do learners fixate their attention when watching foreign language videos with captions? Do they look at the captions or do they not? These are very simple basic questions that researchers have asked before, but we were the first that we knew of to do it with an eye tracker to get an accurate count of how much they take they use the, the captions. We also want to know about the script differences. So we did this in four different languages, Chinese, Arabic, Spanish, and Russian, so that we could see across the different languages are there different amounts of time that people look at captions. And then we also looked at two different contents of video, familiar or unfamiliar. So here we started small, which is a few participants in each language. And we used documentaries that had one person speaking, one on migratory patterns of salmon, and another one, a story, a narrative about a mother bear that lost her cub and then later finds the cub. So uh, they were dubbed in the four target languages by female native speakers, and then we captioned them. We also sl spliced sound back in, um, like of water splashing in the background noise, so it didn't sound just too um, drab for the students. Um, but let me move to the data, because we showed some students um, video one with captions or without captions, and the same with video two. Oh, and this is what it looked like on screen. We had to move the video up so that the caption area is more towards the middle of the screen where the data is more accurate. So let me see if I can get this to play. Hmm. I'll see if I can get this to show you the video, and then I will quickly just give you the results. Существует удивительная история о рыбах. 
о первоклассных подводных путешественниках. Каждый год тысячи лососей проплывают много миля от океана, к той же самой реке, где они родились. Это длительное и опасное путешествие. So when we were analyzing the data, this is what it looked like. So we were looking, are they reading the captions or are they looking at the video? To get at the very first study that we did, just a difference, how much time are they spending on the captions? So what we found is that people are looking at the captions. Uh, they're looking at the captions rather than the video. They are using them for, for listening comprehension, for understanding the overall meaning. But we also found differences. Um, let me move to the differences. So, yes, we found that Arabic learners and Chinese learners spent more time on the captions in Russian and Spanish. So they used it more often. We did interviews with them afterwards to find out why. And of course, the Arabic and Chinese learners said that the text was much more difficult to comprehend. So we showed the same videos to everyone in second um, year, second semester of these languages, and the videos themselves were harder for learners of Arabic and Chinese because those languages traditionally take more time for native English speakers to learn because of the linguistic and cultural differences. Um, so let me skip down. I'm sorry, I'm running out of time. <laughs> okay. So I have recommendations for future eye tracking studies. Future studies on captioning can investigate specific words on which learners fixate. We haven't done that yet. Are they nouns, verbs, adjectives? How do learners' eye tracking movements correspond with their comprehension of the videos and the acquisition of vocabulary and morphosyntax? So there's still a lot of work to be done. So this might just give you a teaser of some of the research that can be done using eye tracking for SLA research. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now we have almost uh, 12, 12 minutes for discussion, so any questions? Thanks, so that was really, really interesting. Um, and actually I figured out the first one you were talking about from Canada, that's the one that we just got at UWM. So oh, nice. I'm, I'm wondering, like, first of all, just when you're showing the videos of like the green dots and stuff, can you do that with either one that you have, either of the trackers? Yes, they both do that. So the one, um, yeah, and on Monday I'm giving a talk to um, students at 4.30, and I'm going to show the other eye tracker and what it looks like. But yes, they, they both will do the, the videos. Now those videos you can download and import into NVivo to code qualitatively. Um, or in both programs, you can de designate areas of interest and say, how much time did they spend looking at this word in particular? Or how many entrances and exits into that area of interest did people make? Um, so yeah, so there are a number of different ways to analyze the data. The data is copious. It's amazing how much data you do get. So that's why you don't want to collect from too many people unless you're looking at averages. Um, but for the Toby eye tracker with qualitative data where you're coding, all right, do they read the directions first or not? Um, if you're investigating how test taking behaviors, for example. And that's something you can look at individually in each person's video and say, yeah, that person read the directions, that person didn't. But you could also put an area of interest around it and say, how much time did they actually spend reading any parts of the directions. Yeah, things like that. Okay, so right at the beginning you're talking about the two different models, the easy reader and the swift model, and then later on you're talking after your first experiments about the individual differences. I'm just wondering if it's possible that um, different people like do read in different ways, and if some could use this easy reader and some could do the swift, because I think you said that for the swift model they they more go ahead and then go back? Yeah, well, I think that the Swift and Easy Reader are theoretical models that are debated in cognitive science and linguistics um, and psychology. So that is maybe where I just stand back and let them work that out, <laughs> right? And so I read it for background information, but I think that debate is still ongoing and a very healthy, robust theoretical description of how people read and 
and how cognition is linked to what you look at. Um, so I don't know, it's not my place to say, I, I, I don't really know enough to judge. I can say I like aspects of the easy reader because it helps justify the foundations of I, why I look at eye movement records. I think there is a link between what people are looking at. But I know that sometimes your eye has fatigue or um, there's aberrations in the reading process that are not done, so you're not, your eye movements don't change because of your thought, it's a mechanical thing. So that might be more swift model. Um, I refer to the psycholinguist for that. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah. Hi, I have a question about the results of the second study since you didn't have as much time to yeah. go into them. Well, I think your second question was whether script makes a difference to the reading. And, but when you got the difference for Chinese and Arabic versus Russian Spanish, you said that's because the languages are harder to learn. But I'm wondering if you found anything interesting specifically that you think is due to script differences. Yeah, this is where the research on um, you know, the density of the script makes such a big difference mm -hmm. um, in times of, for adult native speakers of Chinese spend more time reading. So we're, I'm still trying to tease apart the data of because I have so many confounding variables. They're looking at a denser script, but also in the interviews they said, actually my Chinese teacher never shows videos. We've never seen captioned videos in Chinese. Then I look at the difference between the Spanish textbooks that come with their own DVD of a, a made for Spanish instruction soap opera that is captioned or subtitled in English and they can toggle between them. There's so much more use of captions. Um, so another area of research that's being done, Belgium and Holland have government programs to caption popular television and news. China does that too. So they fund studies there to see how much public good this is in terms of multilingualism and multilingual development. Um, in the US, it's kind of just coming from the language teachers. So I, I think we'll see more of that research coming out of Europe um, and maybe out of China too as they look at the benefits, of, the social benefits of captioning on public television. Um, but yeah, I'm still trying to tease that apart. What is it? Is it because they're not used to it or is it because of the linguistic density? Yeah. Hi, um, I've got a, a question. I took part in an eye tracking study last semester, and it was an interesting experience mm -hmm. because uh, when I they were trying to calibrate my eyes with the with the screen, it wouldn't do it, mm -hmm. and I had to repeat it at least three times. And uh, a girl who was doing it, she started a colleague of mine. She told me she did it to another girl, and. So now that you were saying about uh, the eyelashes or the color, so we well she has like the other girl had like really like full eyelashes, uh, black hair and everything, but she didn't have any problems. I use a lot of mascara, which I didn't know what that uh, <laughs> affected, but that's good to know. But she has really big eyes, and I don't. That's like the size of the eye have an effect. I think it does. Yes. Um, like we I also like open my eyes a lot. Yes. But I didn't yes. Work. Yes, I think it does, yeah, and I mean sometimes we'll run someone and we have no idea why it's not working, but we do have about a 15 to 20, 25 percent loss because the eye tracker won't track the eyes, okay. yeah. So then we run the study with that person because they showed up to the lab, we get as much data as we can, we pay them the $25, and then we don't have the eye movement record, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, before I forget, actually, so I work on eye tracking, but in the visual world paradigm, so a lot oh, yeah. of this is new and mm -hmm. exciting for me. Um, but we use an iLink 1000, and I would say maybe a 2 or 3% attrition. Oh, per. that's great. So mm -hmm. maybe we're doing something. Maybe wrong. we can, t I, there's a lot of different <laughs> lighting tricks we can talk later yes. and maybe see if yes. I can help mm -hmm. you move that 20%. Mm -hmm. I, don't, mm -hmm. I don't know why we're, well, maybe you know we're what? just With lucky. My study, too, were all Koreans. So I know we had yeah, a student who was doing Asian with heritage tend to be harder, uh, and at least anecdotally in what it is anecdotal because yeah. of mm -hmm. in in my experience. Mm -hmm. um, but my question had more to do the top the topic of your your the title of your talk was 
what can we tell about cognitive processes from eye tracking? Mm -hmm. And although I know we already kind of pushed you on that, I'd love to hear you speculate just a little bit more on that. Eye trackers really only tell us how long did someone look at some certain location. What leaps can we make? What assumptions can we have as to whether if someone looks longer at something, does that mean it's harder or they're paying more attention? How much how far do you think we can get from, oh, we have the XY coordinates of where this person looked to this is harder to think about or this requires more attention or anything like that? Yeah, yeah. And I think some of the, yes, and that is a big, er, a rich area of research. Um, there have been studies where um, Aline Godfroyd, my colleague, did a study where she had Belgian learners of English uh, read English, but she inserted fake words. So we knew these words would cause processing difficulties because these words don't exist, right? Um, so instead of saying, you know, the boundaries of the map, she'll put the pampa lines of the map, right? So we know that that should cause processing difficulties, but then we look and see um, how much of a processing difficulty did it have. And then she asked students later, um, I can't remember the order of the questions, but she'll say, what does pampalines mean? Some of them can deduce the meaning of that word. They learn through reading. Um, and some of them didn't. Uh, so then if she has a large enough population, she can see if the ones who learned from it, who spent time looking at it, did they spend significantly more time than those who didn't learn and looked at it less often. And she is finding that. So from an SLA perspective, we're finding that students you know, can learn by reading. And we can see evidence of that by how much cognitive attention they pay while learning. So when your teacher says, pay, pay attention, <laughs> you do see evidence of learning. So you can tie it into individual differences, too. Like I tried with working memory capacity, um, attention span, different measures of um, cognitive functioning to see if those help explain covariate of, of this intentional mechanism. Yeah, so I think it's a really rich area. But you have to get a baseline data, too. Um, you have to compare people who learn versus those who don't, or people who see something enhanced versus those who don't. And there's never an arbitrary cutoff saying these people pay attention and these people don't at a 500 millisecond line. It's much more robust and rich than that. And there's individual variation. Like 500 milliseconds might mean I'm really thinking about it, but someone else 400 milliseconds, maybe they weren't. So it, it depends. You need large numbers, and that's hard to get with eye tracking. Yeah. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. um, have you looked at all uh, morphology, so either languages with uh, greater morphology or specific words that have a lot of morphology and whether that might affect the amount of time? I have not, but my colleague Patty Spinner does. She's looking at Swahili. Um, so yeah, there are studies that are doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's more of a, a, a UG formalist. So yeah, she's definitely interested in that. And she has some published studies, uh, two published studies on morphology with eye tracking. Mm -hmm. For your first experiment, uh, when you provide a visual um, enhancement, and then that was only for the passive verb phrase, right? And then right. which the learners did not learn, right? Right. Do you think if you provide the same visual enhancement for the words that learners already know, and then compare the two conditions, mm -hmm. do you think there might be some effect? Because it could be the case that the the longer reading time is due to their the visual saliency yeah. or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you should, yes. I think that, that there's another variable, too, is the fact that that form is just repeated throughout the text so many times. And then they call it input flood. Um, yeah, that would be a great next step. So maybe an MA thesis or a PhD dissertation in the brew. Yeah, mm -hmm. that would be great. 
I ha I have just one comment like in some high stake testing as well, like in IELTS International English Language Testing System. In the reading section, they use some of the figures and charts, whereas some of the tests they don't use that. So are there any studies of that, how that figures are tagged on the charts, they are assisting in the reading Yeah, um, well, I don't know in the, in the Bax and Weir in um, Holland have looked at the IELTS test, but I think they looked at the reading comprehension part, and I can't remember if there were charts or tables in it, but they have a published study in the um, IELTS reading notes, the research notes that they publish, and Weir, W-E-I-R, published a paper based on that data in language testing last year. So there is some research in that area as well. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Winky. Um, as she mentioned before, um, uh, Professor Winky will again be giving a talk on a different topic on Monday. It's in FLB um, in the Lucia Ellis Lounge at 4 p.m. It's part of the Linguistics Club lecture. So hope to see most of you there. I have a few more announcements announcements before we wrap up, but I like to give it to um, Amelia too. She, was, she has some announcements to make before that. <laughs>